Hey everyone, I'm Ron Murray with the Aurora Chasers, and today I'm going to help you figure out what gear you'll need to successfully photograph the Northern Lights. Whether you're looking for a complete system, a lens suggestion, or just a good tripod, we'll be covering those details. So let's get started. Every year, Marquetta and I lead hundreds of clients out into the remote wilderness of Alaska and guide them through setting up their cameras to capture the best Aurora images possible. As a result, we've seen dozens of different camera and lens combinations over the years, and we've learned the ins and outs of most of the common systems. In fact, we use multiple systems ourselves. Marquetta shoots uh, Canon, and I shoot Nikon and Sony. On top of that, we rent out a variety of systems to folks who just want to try out their hand at capturing the Northern Lights without making the commitment to what is a substantial gear investment. This means that we know the strengths and weaknesses to most of the setups and the best lens combos for most camera bodies. Now, for this video, I'm only going to be covering cameras specifically for the purpose of photographing the Northern Lights. And as such, I won't be touching on every camera and lens option out there. That would be a very long video. Instead, I'll be focusing on what we feel are the best options for Aurora photography and the best current options available for most major manufacturers as of now. Before I get started, let's talk about what your needs are and how much money you should be spending. You could easily spend over $10,000 on a camera, lens, tripod, and the rest of the setup for Aurora photography. You can also easily get a good setup for under $1,000. Think long and hard about how you'll be using the images and where you'll be using the images. It's not necessary if you're going to put them on social media and share them with friends and family on Instagram and Facebook and through email to go out and spend $10,000 on a camera kit. Because most folks wouldn't be able to tell the difference honestly between a $1,000 setup and a $10,000 setup when you post it to social media. So if that's your goal, keep that in mind and don't necessarily invest so heavily in one of these bigger systems. Now, if you think you're gonna be making large prints with these, that might be a little bit different story. You're gonna want a camera with a little bit more resolution. You may want a full frame camera. You're gonna need better optics because when we do start to blow those prints up, we do end up seeing some discrepancies in lens quality quality and sensors, uh, noise performance, things like that. That said, keep in mind your ultimate goal and decide what's right for you and what fits within your budget. Um, you can do this fairly inexpensively, but you can also spend a lot of money. So keep in mind where your target photos are going to go and what your needs are. There's three basic necessities when it comes to good camera equipment for Northern Lights photography. Number one, the camera does need to be good in low light. It needs to have good ISO performance. So somewhere in the range of 1600 or better, uh, fairly cleanly is what you're looking for. We do need a fast aperture wide angle lens. So fast aperture means a, uh, a aperture that opens uh, very near to the maximum diameter, somewhere in the range of f2.8 or wider in the aperture, faster rather, is kind of what we're looking for. And we'll delve into the why in a little bit. But we also want a wide angle lens. Keep in mind, we are covering a big giant sky out there. And so we need to make sure that we're capturing all of that information and still have some room for the foreground. So a wide angle lens is very important. And then the final thing you'll need is a good solid tripod. Tripods are critical for Northern Lights photography because we are dealing with long exposures. So keep that in mind and make sure you get a good one. We'll cover those in more detail a little bit later in the video, so stick around. Now let's talk about the different camera options available. There are several different options that you could choose from, including DSLRs, mirrorless, and point and shoots. We're going to primarily be focusing on DSLRs and mirrorless, but there are a couple point and shoots that will do some Aurora photography. Most, unfortunately, will not. They're not up to the task. Um, pretty much any modern DSLR built in about the last, say, six years uh, is going to have good enough ISO performance and capabilities to capture Northern Lights. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Almost any APS-C sensor or full-frame mirrorless camera is going to be good enough. In fact, that is kind of the way of the future and that is where uh, we're seeing the biggest improvements is in the mirrorless world. And that's what I'm filming myself with here and what I take photos of the Northern Lights with. Uh, Marquetta uses Canon systems, I use Sony systems, and we both use mirrorless. 
Um, so I would consider that if you're not already heavily invested in the DSL, DSLR market, because that is where the future is going. Uh, we will all be shooting mirrorless, I would assume, uh, fairly soon. So uh, keep that in mind. And then as far as point and shoots go, there are a couple different options out there. Sony RX100 series is a great series that can do it. Um, there is a very limited uh, a couple models of the Canon PowerShot that will do it. Uh, most things like the cool picks and most of the power shot models and quite frankly most point and shoots just aren't up to the task. Some of those are artificial limitations that the camera manufacturers put into those cameras to re prevent us from doing long exposures at high ISOs. So that's one thing to consider. Um, some of them just the image quality is honestly terrible. Uh, so I would consider either a APS-C sensor, micro four thirds maybe sensor, or full frame mirrorless, or a DSLR. Now I did mention uh, mirrorless was probably a good way to future proof yourself. If you're just brand new to this and you're trying to get started in photography and you think this is something you're gonna wanna do and maybe you're going to invest down the road, my suggestion is start with a good budget-friendly mirrorless system and then work your way up into uh, maybe the larger mirrorless systems. I would not, if I were starting out, invest uh, at all in the DSLR world. Um, the writing's on the wall. Canon and Sony have clearly said uh, mirrorless is the way of the future, and Nikon is definitely dipping their toes in as well. Um, so if you're brand new, look at the mirrorless systems first. Um, keep in mind, though, that if you're just on a budget and you want to test the waters, you can often find some older DSLR kits uh, for really reasonable prices used. So there's always that option. Now, let's talk about full frame versus APS-C and kind of the difference between those two and then how it relates to Aurora photography. Full frame is the same size sensor, or the sensor in the camera, rather, is the same size as a 35 millimeter piece of film, whereas APS-C is 24 millimeters, so it's slightly smaller, which means that it has a little bit limited field of view and there's a bit of a crop factor. So say to do to make math easy, we'll say uh, 10 millimeters on a full frame camera would be 15 millimeters on most crop bodies or 16 millimeters on Canon. So Nikon and Sony are 1.5 as well as Fuji and Canon is a 1.6 crop. So keep that in mind when you're looking for wide angle lenses, if you have an APS-C system, uh, you're gonna need a little bit wider focal length to get the equivalent of what we're shooting on full frames. Another thing to keep in consideration is that pixel density and size can be quite dramatic between APS-C size sensors and full frame sensors. So if you're taking 24 megapixels in a crop sensor, and then you put that same 24 megapixels in a full frame sensor, the pixels become much larger and therefore they're able to gather light better. So you do tend to get better quality uh, out of a full frame sensor for low light situations. So that's why we shoot full frame. But APS-C size sensors can still do a great job. Now, as far as the top cameras, I'm gonna go through a couple of different brands in the full frame range and give you guys some ideas of what we think are some of the better camera options out there for Northern Lights photography. Um, as I mentioned, pretty much anything with acceptable ISO of 1600 and full manual controls will do the job. But if you're investing and you wanna get into a newer system and you're looking at the best of the best, let's cover some of the options. So right now on the market, the top three from the top three manufacturers, which would be Sony, Nikon, and Canon. Let's start with Sony. The A7 III would be my prime choice for Northern Lights photography. And that's simply because it's not the top of the line Sony camera, but it is kind of the sweet spot between resolution, ISO performance, low light. It, it's just that perfect sweet spot for Aurora photography. So the A7 III would be my choice there. For Canon, you have a lot of different options right now. You have the EOS R, which is a mirrorless. You have the R5, which just came out, amazing camera. Or more preferably, probably for Aurora photography would be the R6. Uh, that's the one I would go with if I were picking up Canon's new mirrorless systems. And Astro and Aurora photography were my primary focus. And of course, with Canon's DSLRs, you have the Canon 5D Mark IV, as well as the 6D Mark II, which are both great options for Northern Lights photography. 
Uh, and then on the Nikon, you've got the Z5, the Z, sorry, the Z6 and 7, the D850, which is honestly one of the best night cameras out there. It's got lighted buttons. It's got amazing low light performance, uh, just an all around amazing camera, but it is a DSLR. So if you're already into some Nikon DSLR lenses, that would be a great option. Uh, or a D750, which is several years old, but still performs really well. Um, but if you're new to this and you're looking at it, the Z5, which is brand new, brand new full frame on a budget price for Nikon, or the Z6 or 7 would be great options as well. Now, when we get into APS-C sensor cameras, the market becomes even more crowded, and so it's a little bit harder to distinguish. Uh, I'm going to give you kind of what I consider to be the top four brands. So you've got the Fuji X-T4, the uh, Canon uh, 90D, the, let's see, Nikon has the D7500, I believe, is their top of the line APS-C right now. And then Sony has several. They have a 6500, a 6600, the A6300, or the A6400. Of all of those, my choice would be the A6600 because it does have the newer battery, which becomes critical if you're out photographing northern lights in the cold. The older batteries in the Sony cameras didn't last very long, so you definitely want to make sure you get that uh, FZ100 battery, uh, which the A66 has. And then there are some great options in the Micro Four Thirds systems as well. Uh, Olympus is the one I'm most familiar with and probably what would get my top recommendation. Um, their OMD EM1 series, especially the Mark II, their brand new flagship or newish flagship, uh, definitely works well. I've seen those out on the tours and got to play with them and they work really well. So that would get my pick for Micro Four Thirds. And there's also some great budget-friendly options, both in full-frame and APS-C size sensors. So on the Canon Nikon side, you've got the EOS RP from Canon, which is a great full-frame budget camera. And then, as mentioned before, Nikon has that Z5. Uh, both of those would be great options if you're on a budget, but you still want that full-frame quality. Now, for Sony, they don't currently have a budget full-frame camera. The a7 III is probably the closest thing to it. There are rumors about that, but I won't speculate. Uh, you'll have to stay tuned to see what they end up offering. On the APS-C side of things, uh, you have lots of great options, and Sony especially is the highlight of the bunch there. For uh, under $1,000, you can get an A6000, a Rokinon 12mm lens, and a Manfrotto tripod, and you'll have a great kit to go out and photograph Northern Lights with. On the Canon side, any of the Rebel series are also great options, so I would look into those. Uh, and on the Nikon side, the 5000 series. I do not recommend the 3000 series. While they're great cameras for Aurora photography, they are a bit cumbersome. And that has more to do with just how they function with the self-timer feature and not having a port on the newer models to plug in a remote shutter. Uh, so I would recommend spending an extra little bit and getting the 5000 series and making sure that it's one that has the port for the shutter release cable. Um, so 5000 series on the Nikons, the Rebel series on the Canons, and then an A6000 on the Sony side of things. And I do wanna just jump in here and mention right now that I have put together several different kits that you guys can go. So if you don't wanna jot all this down or memorize it, I have built out an entire list of good kits as well as lenses that will work with things and the right tripods for those different kits. And I will be putting that in the links below. Uh, it will be kit.co slash the Aurora Chasers, um, but I'll drop the links below. You can go there, check them out. You can look at the camera kit that's, that uh, you're considering, or maybe you already have one of those cameras. If you know you have a full frame Canon, you can look at the options that we have there. Um, there'll be the right tripod suggestions. Uh, there'll be suggestions for uh, which lens you should use with each body and our top picks of camera, lens, tripod combos. So check that out at kit.co slash the Aurora Chasers. Let's get into lenses. So the best lens for Sony full frame is gonna be the 16 to 35 F 2.8 G Master or the 12 to 24 2.8 G Master. That 12 to 24 is a pretty niche lens, but it is probably the perfect lens for astro and night sky photography. It is also very expensive because it is a niche lens, so keep that in mind. 
For Canon, the classic 16 to 35 uh, 2.8 if you're shooting on a DSLR body or the new 15 to 35 2.8 RF mount if you're shooting one of the new R mirrorless bodies. And then for Nikon, uh, unfortunately for their mirrorless system, they don't have a good wide angle that I can recommend, but Rokinon makes a 14 millimeter 2.8 uh, that works pretty well on the Nikon uh, Z mounts. And then if you're shooting the DSLRs for Nikon, the old classic 14 to 24 is hands down one of the best night sky lenses that has ever been built. Uh, if you're not looking for prime, if you're looking for something with some zoom and by the way, primes are great, uh, and they definitely have their place. And there are times where I prefer to use a prime, but Overall, I like to be able to zoom a little bit for composition with the Aurora because you never know if you're going to be shooting a nice big wide sky or maybe if you want to narrow in a little bit and just have a composition with trees or a person or something like that. So um, I like to have a little bit of zoom range. Um, on budget side of things, almost every manufacturer out there, uh, Rokinon builds a 14 millimeter 2.8 for the full frames and a 12 millimeter 2.0 for the APS-C sensors. So let's talk about some of those options. For the Sony, that's what you're gonna use, that 12 millimeter f2.0. For Canon and Nikon, I would actually suggest the Tokina 11 to 20 f2.8. That is just a spectacular lens for those APS-C or crop sensor Canon and Nikon cameras. And then for the Fuji, again, that 12 millimeter Rokinon. And that 12 millimeter 2.0 Rokinon, I believe is available for quite a few different models. So check that out as well. Um, but I do like that zoom range, as I mentioned. So for the Canon and Nikon, uh, I'd still probably go with that Tokini 11 to 20 millimeter. Okay, just like with our cameras, when it comes to tripods, there is an array of different options, price points, uh, ball heads, pan tilt heads, uh, gear heads, all kinds of different things. So let's break some of that down and let's talk about what you should be using for Aurora photography. The very first thing is pan and tilt heads are not very useful out there because if you're off level, then it's really difficult to get that camera leveled up. And a lot of times when we're out photographing Aurora in nature, we are off level. We're slightly skewed one way or the other. Uh, and so you can adjust legs and things like that, but it's just a constant battle. The best thing to do is honestly just get yourself a good ball head uh, for that tripod. You will thank me later. It's going to save you loads and loads of time and just make life generally easy. And as far as the tripods themselves go, we definitely prefer lever lock over twist lock tripods. And that's because out in the cold, we've seen so many of those twist locks where people over twist them, the legs come off. They're honestly, they just take longer. They're harder to deal with with gloves on. And so the lever locks, even with a big th thick set of gloves on, you can flip those levers open, close them, uh, makes life easier. So I prefer those, and that's what I would suggest to you, and that's what you'll find in our kit suggestions. Um, you can definitely spend a lot of money on a tripod, and you can go very cheap on a tripod, but tripods are not the place to skimp. I would suggest you know you skimp almost on lenses or cameras over the tripod, because the tripod is going to make life just so much easier for you if you have a good one. And they don't have to cost a huge amount, um, but you do want to spend enough that you're not going to have stuff break. I've seen so many tripods just fall apart in the cold. So um, get the right tripod. Um, we really like the Manfrotto's. They seem to work really well. They've held up for a long time over the years. We have almost 20 of them between our rentals and our personal tripods and we've had really great luck with that and so that's what we suggest the ball head that we suggest with them is a dry ball head so that means it doesn't freeze up and kind of quit moving on you it works really well and then finally about tripods uh, there are different styles. So if you're gonna travel with it a lot, I definitely recommend checking the weight of your camera and lens setup and make sure that you've got one that's heavy duty enough for that setup. Um, typically, I like a heavier tripod. Um, oftentimes, I'll go with a steel or aluminum tripod over a uh, carbon fiber tripod just because most of the time mine's in my vehicle and then I'm hiking out a short distance uh, and making those shots and that good heavy tripod stays nice and solid and doesn't get blown around if there's a little bit of wind or something. Again, we're doing long exposures here, so uh, keeping that camera steady is important. 
Um, the other thing is, if you are going to travel with it, though, maybe you do want a lighter tripod, maybe something like carbon fiber. And there are four section and three section versions. So you can get the same model of tripod in either a three section or a four section. If you can make the three section fit in your backpack or suitcase or whatever it is you're going to be traveling with, I always suggest that because the bottom section on a four section tends to be really, really frail and honestly often isn't too terribly useful anyway for long exposures. You can get away with it, uh, but it wouldn't be my choice. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, if you just need it to once in a while shoot, you're not going to be doing a lot of long exposures. Yeah, you can get away with it. Hang, a, hang your backpack off of it to make it a little more stable, uh, a little bit more weight, things like that. Um, but the, the three section are definitely going to be a little more solid. Okay. Let's talk about some other useful accessories. Uh, headlamps are definitely going to be a necessity. Um, that allows you to turn on a light, uh, see your camera gear and not have to have a hand tied up with a flashlight or something so that you can make those adjustments and kind of just take care of everything right on the fly. Then you can turn it back off. Definitely a must is get one with a red LED function that you can turn on without cycling through. Um, we will have that in that, those links as well. So we'll suggest a good uh, headlamp, the one that we use, actually a Black Diamond Cosmo. Um, really useful headlamp. Um, and the reason for red is red does not affect our night vision. So if you're out there in the dark, you've let your eyes adjust and you're able to see now up in the sky uh, and you turn on a bright white light, uh, your night vision goes away. And so does everybody else that's around you. So make sure that you're using that red light. It will still affect everybody's photos, so don't turn it on without asking if you're around other folks. Um, but that red light won't hurt anybody's night vision. Another great thing to keep along with you is Ziploc bags, large enough for your camera and lens together. Because when you bring your camera in from the cold, it gets kind of condensation on it. And so if you put it in a Ziploc bag first and then bring it inside and then put it in your camera bag, all of those things are gonna help protect your camera and keep moisture out of it. And then for some extra uh, safety, just throw a couple desiccant packs either in that Ziploc bag or in your camera bag to make sure that things stay nice and cleaned up. And then finally, uh, some hand warmers to keep your hands warm. Maybe you can throw them down in your boots if you get cold. And gaffer's tape. Gaffer's tape is one of the biggest things that I use almost anywhere. I almost always keep a roll in my camera bag no matter what I'm doing because it's super useful. Um, primary purpose for it with Aurora photography is once you get the focus set, you want to tape your lens so that you don't accidentally bump it. Um, there's other uses for it, of course. Uh, the good thing about gaffer's tape is it is made for camera equipment, and so it goes onto your equipment and comes back off cleanly. It's not like duct tape where it's going to leave all that weird residue, and you're going to have to deal with cleaning that up. It'll peel right back off. And unless it's extremely cold, a lot of times you can peel it off, reuse it over and over. So um, I love that stuff. Keep some of that in your camera bag. All right, guys. Uh, we'd be happy to do a Q&A live stream on this topic as well. So if you guys are thinking maybe you have some specific questions about your camera, your lens, your setup, what tripod to get, um, all of that stuff, let us know in the comments below and we'll schedule up a live stream and we can just chat. Uh, we can go over some of this stuff. Also, keep in mind, we will be putting out a class schedule where you can do an online workshop with us, either one-on-one -on -one if you need some personal attention or in a group setting virtually uh, through our website. So be checking the website or our Facebook or check back here for that information uh, and we'll be sure to post about it when those are live. I'm thinking early September we're going to start running those. And so if you guys are trying to try this out and you want to learn the basics of Aurora photography, we'll give you the same workshop that we give on our tours. Also, be sure to check out theauroraChasers.com for our tour information. We are not able to run this fall, unfortunately, due to this crazy pandemic thing that's going on, but we are hopeful that maybe by the spring, things are going to start to settle down and we'll be running again. So we are scheduling for the spring season. You can always do a gift card if you want to schedule when it's more secure to travel, uh, things like that. So stay tuned there and still working on publishing that Aurora footage video as well.
Guys, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up. That's always helpful if you learned anything. And tune back in uh, because over the next several weeks, I will be covering multiple topics for questions that I get often. Some of our FAQs, things like that about traveling to see the Aurora, best times to see the Aurora, all of that kind of stuff. So check back each week and make sure that you're not missing that. Or better yet, subscribe and click that bell icon so that you never miss any of that content. All right, guys, always grateful that you guys tune in. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.